learn your body's language. Uh, it doesn't speak with words, but it does speak with pain and mobility and strength and energy. Yeah, restrictions. So, and, and don't ignore them. Like th that is the language of your body. And if your body's telling you something like, man, why is my knee feeling stiff all of a sudden? Or my energy levels are not what they normally are. Um, don't just, uh, okay, that's just what it is. It would be like ignoring me in your ear telling you something. Like, don't ignore those the language of your body it's saying something. And then what happens is, what happens if I'm talking to Justin and I'm trying to tell Justin, hey, watch out. If you step over there, you're going to fall. And he doesn't listen to me. I'm going to say it again, but how am I going to say it? Louder. And eventually I'm going to yell at Justin because I don't want him to hurt himself. That's what your body does. So the pain, the pain signals or whatever the, the language is of your body – if it gets louder and louder and louder to the point where you can't ignore it anymore. And what does that look like? I can't move. I'm sick. Uh, what the hell is wrong with me? Shin splints, they suck. But did you know they're easy to fix? They are. You just got to strengthen your tibialis muscle. That's it. Do some toe raises. And for many of you, those shin splints will disappear. Do you guys uh, remember when you figured this out? Yeah, I do. And I, but you should please explain that muscle and where that's at so oh, people yeah. understand. People are going, like, What is that? Where I is that? Yeah. <laughs> Googling right now. Yeah, it's not a common uh, muscle. No, no. In fact, no. there's very, I mean, one of my favorite things about the golds over here, and they actually have the little machine for it, and you rarely mm -hmm. find that. Yeah, machine no, for it. you don't necessarily need a machine either. No, you don't. Ball. It you makes you need easier. a wall. Yeah. So obviously, you have your calf on the back of the leg, but here on the front is your tibialis muscle, and it's the muscle that's responsible for pulling your toes back towards your shin. So toe raises would be uh, standing on my heels and lifting my toes up as hard as I can, or standing on a block, trying not to slide down, let my toes dip and then lift them up. And you'll feel the front of your shin burn and you'll feel the muscle working. Shin splints typically occur from a strength imbalance, right? The yeah. calves really strong, but the shin muscle, the tibialis is not strong enough to prevent uh, the reverberations from causing inflammation in that shin, and then you get pain. And what people do they tape their shins up and yeah. do a bunch of crazy stuff, but or try and roll them or roll them. I remember when I figured this out. I it was like when I when I had clients come to me with shin splints early on, my advice was always, well, let's back off on the running, mm -hmm. let's rest, and they get better, and they go run again, and they get shin splints again. And then I remember being like, what if we strengthen that area? And I had someone do it. It was like. It fixed it right away. It was Bro, so crazy. It's so crazy because it, there used to be this thought that it was like these micro fractures, you know. Like <laughs> oh, I, I yeah. remember them telling me that. Even like athletic trainers told me that. And I'm like, well, there's really nothing you can do with that other than ice it, wait for it to heal, recover. And then I'm like, this isn't going to work. And, you know, I finally had a smart um, trainer come up and be like, okay, hey, try this out and like do some TBLS raises. <laughs> and it was like, oh, wow, you started to gain connection again and support. And so when you get back out on the field, it doesn't like get so inflamed right away. Yeah, I was an idiot. I was trying to foam roll it back in the days. That's what I was. That's what I thought to do. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was the only answer to it was like foam roll before you go out and play. And it would help a little bit. Yeah. And or stretch. Like I'd stretch a little bit and that also would help a little bit, but it wouldn't get rid of it. It wasn't until I started to realize that like almost every like injury that's not acute that happens in the body or chronic pain is always due to an imbalance. One yeah, muscle on weakness. one side is strong, the other side is weak. And that weakness is what's causing the imbalance. And that's normally in the, the consistent repetitive movements, whether it be a sport you're doing or sometimes just walking mm -hmm. or sitting, uh, ends up wearing on the body. And then you get these issues like this. And it was like, once I understood that, then I started to look at almost every you know, complaint from a client differently. Yeah. It was just like, oh, okay, let's first, let's see if there is a, a weakness going on here and let's address that and let's see if that mm -hmm. helps. And helps. even the, in the majority of athletes too that have like <clears throat> these cramping issues or have like um, uh, just tightness or, or muscles that, that tend to kind of respond negatively, like as we're out there in the field, it's like they do not have a great electrolyte balance either. So they're, they're just drinking, maybe they're drinking water and trying to stay hydrated, which is great. But like, you know, not retaining that intramuscular fluid it, within all this like crazy demanding movement. It's just, it exposes a lot of those things. Yeah. It well, might, my strategy went from, oh, that hurts. Let's avoid it to, oh, that hurts. Let's strengthen it. Very different strategy. One of them solves the root cause. The other one just temporarily alleviates pain because you avoid it. But then it comes back, um, and tibialis raises strength and literally directly strengthen the muscle that you need to have to be strong to prevent uh, those shin splints. Well, along those lines of talking about weaknesses and stuff and, and then bringing up sports, Justin, and maybe Doug can look this up for me because I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I believe it is the highest 
uh, injury is in hamstrings and hamstring pull. Ba- yeah, in baseball players and football players, and that is a, a, is strictly a weakness thing. Yeah. Yes, it, it's because their quads are so strong and dominant, and then they have the in in comparison to their hamstrings, and the hamstrings can't keep up. Yeah. Their quads are pedaling their legs. Of stops. Yes, and it's like you, to decelerate. Like now they haven't they haven't really got the kind of fast twitch response out of their hamstrings like that before. It puts so much demanding stress on it that they don't have the strength to uh, be able to pull that off to slow down it's boom it's you yeah. know injury what about shoulder pain shoulder pain from throwing it's not the generating force part it's the f- fact that you don't have the muscles that are strong enough to decelerate and stabilize when you throw with speed yeah so it's it's all it's almost always not always but it's almost always a weakness that's the uh, the problem you look at female athletes you know their acl tear rate is i think it's something like it's like twice as high or something like that for female athletes than the, than the males, and that's yeah. because their hips are their hip to knee angle is greater, right? Girls tend to have a wider hips than boys do, mm-hmm. and because of that, they get ACL tears. But you can fix that by strengthening the appropriate muscles and the appropriate movement to the point where those ACL tears disappear. Yeah. But if you don't. You have this imbalance that happens, and you cause yourself some problems. Base, baseball was actually rotator cuff. I thought it was hamstring. oh throwing. Yeah, football was hamstring, and then baseball was rotator cuff. Yeah, also yeah. a weakness issue, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you ever uh, what's that game that you play sometimes? Boxing or whatever on your Oculus? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how how do you if you don't practice that decelerate? How do your shoulders feel <laughs> yeah, afterwards? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's a little it's, embarrassing. It I is. <laughs> I've had that happen before. Yeah. I'm, so, yeah. I'm, I'm air punching it. I can't <laughs> say. Well, especially, you know, you know that punching and not hitting something. Yeah, it's worse. It is yeah, because yeah, at least yeah. when you hit something, it slows down for yeah, you. Yeah, no, but when you right. you have to slow it down yourself, especially if you're if you have yeah. a lot of acceleration and strength. Well, uh, in terms of like uh um, shin splints, like the, what I noticed the most was when you change surfaces. Yeah. Uh, and so I had a harder surface, like definitely the transition from football being out on the field to then basketball was oh. brutal. I remember just getting shin splints like crazy and nobody had good answers for me back then. So I mean, this is definitely a helpful tip. If people have any athletes or student athletes that, uh, you know, need help with Dude, that. I literally, I can remember as I had a client and shin splints would come up every once in a while with clients. And again, like I said, I'd tell them to, Oh, rest and ice and tape. And this client kept getting them. He would rest and then they'd come back and they'd rest and come back. And I'm like, what the hell is the problem? And I'm like, I wonder if we strengthen, literally my thought process was like, let's just strengthen his, his, his tibialis muscles. And it fixed it fast. I remember too, it was like within a couple of weeks, it's like, they're, it's gone. Yeah. And I felt like, uh, I mean, I felt like a wizard, like, oh my God, I could figure it. And then it was like, oh yeah, obviously. So yeah. uh, let, let's talk about what like a precise protocol would be. I'll tell you what I would probably do with a client like this. I would I would warm them up first with like a combat stretch, and I would do three sets on each side. Yeah, you got to get emphasizing the toe. Part. Yeah, and and yeah. if you've ever seen, if you haven't watched me do the combat stretch on on our YouTube channel, um, I walk you through like how to intensify it at the end. Like I think that's one mm-hmm. of the most important parts to how you do this, especially for someone with shin splints. And then after that, I would probably do a full range of motion calf raise with like a superset of the tibialis toe raises. Yeah. I love And you can just do body weight or if you have a thing that you can have some resistance, but even just lifting them up and getting, yep. getting that burn yep. and, and maybe even holding and doing like an isometric hold yep. and intensifying it and three sets of that. And that person I agree. doing that on a regular basis would be. Yeah. And in someone who doesn't, is not super um, versed in, in mobility, I mean, you can even just do a static stretch of the calves and then strengthen the tibialis. Cause what tends to happen with shin splints is the soleus and the calf gets tight simultaneously mm-hmm. uh, with the problem. And so stretching uh, to, you know. And that's purely weaken. out of trying to protect it, right? Correct. It, yeah. So yeah. it senses there's an injury there, so it tightens up because it doesn't want to push. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, muscles tend to get tight or you're, you are tight in certain areas because your body is trying to it's limit your range of motion because yeah. it knows there's instability. So it's going to keep everything limited to kind of prevent, you know, all these things that you feel from your body is your body actually trying to help you? As annoying as it is, yeah. you're like, why am I so tight? Well, you're, it's better than the alternative. Yeah, that's such a great point yeah. to say that. And like, it, it took me a long time to actually view that, even with my own body, right? It's like, like where's my body trying to protect? We're so, I, I feel like we're so conditioned to feel a little pain or feel a little discomfort and be like, oh, work through it. Be yeah. tough, tough or, it out. Or stupid body. Right, right. Yeah. Or ignore it completely, right? And I think that, Instead of that, like as soon as you notice even the subtle thing off, like your body's trying to talk to you. It's and and trying to dig into that and figure out what is it? Why is this so tight here? Why is this? Part- I love I love the way you said that. Learn your body's language 
uh, it doesn't speak with words, but it does speak with pain and mobility and strength and energy. Yeah, restrictions. So, and, and don't ignore them. Like th that is the language of your body. And if your body's telling you something like, man, why is my knee feeling stiff all of a sudden? Or my energy levels are not what they normally are. Um, don't just, uh, okay, that's just what it is. It would be like ignoring me in your ear telling you something. Like, don't ignore those the language of your body it's saying something. And then what happens is, what happens if I'm talking to Justin and I'm trying to tell Justin, hey, watch out. If you step over there, you're going to fall. And he doesn't listen to me. I'm going to say it again, but how am I going to say it? Louder. And eventually I'm going to yell at Justin because I don't want him to hurt himself. That's what your body does. So the pain, the pain signals or whatever the, the language is of your body – if it gets louder and louder and louder to the point where you can't ignore it anymore. And what does that look like? I can't move. I'm sick. Uh, what the hell is wrong with me? It's like if you think back, there were a lot of a lot of signs. That totally. To I that. mean, how many times have you guys heard that from a client who tells you like, "Oh, this this bothers me or this hurts," or but but I can still do this. You know, I can I can still do it. It's just I wanted you to know that this mm -hmm. I can feel this or it bothers me. It's like, dude, that there's okay. We need to figure that out and get to the bottom of it. No, my favorite would be well, not my favorite, but this was common. A client would be like, man, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, <laughs> this happened to me, and I'll say, well, let's go back a second. You Were know, there so any signs? All of a sudden, you had crushing fatigue, yeah. right? Okay, let's look back. Like, how was your caffeine intake? Well, I'd been ramping it up. Why would you been ramping it up? I thought I needed more. Okay. And I'd go down the list and be like, you know, this, this, this all these signs pointed yeah. to what just happened. It's just you weren't listening. I just, I just picture like, you know, your body's like, you know, just starts by massaging you and giving you a little whisper like, hey, you know, maybe you want to like back off a little bit. <laughs> yeah. you know, hey, hey. And then it like accelerates, yeah. you know, gets more. And you never listen to me, you, you know, know? Yeah. Ah, you know, that's it. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel yeah. like it happens. What's up, y'all? Here's the giveaway for today's Mind Pump podcast episode. It's MAPS Symmetry. This is one of our newer programs. Helps you balance out your body. Lots of unilateral exercises. Real fun workout program. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. And then we'll go through the comments. If we like your comment, we'll notify you. And you'll get free access to MAPS Symmetry. Also, we got a sale going on, okay? The RGB bundle is 50% off. MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, plus Kettlebell for Aesthetics, the Build Your Butt Blueprint, and the Sexy Athlete Modification. Those are all in the RGB bundle. They're all discounted. And then we took an additional 50% off for the sale. If you just want to try one program, though, you're not interested in a bundle, you're like, hey, I just want to try one MAPS program, see what all the hubbub is about. Uh, MAPS Suspension is 50% off. This is a suspension trainer-based workout program, okay? So that one's half off. So if you're interested in either one, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JULY50, so JULY50, no space, for that amazing discount. All right, here comes the show. Tom. Anyway, I got it. So I, I watched Top Gun finally. Yay. I Everybody's took, seen it. I took my daughter in for the talk about it again. <laughs> what a great movie. Phenomenal movie. I'm going to tell you guys the fakest thing about the movie, though. The fakest? Whoa, the, the, whoa, one whoa. Thing, the fakest thing about the whole movie. It's okay, not including the jet maneuvers that aren't possible. No, right. the fakest thing of the whole movie is he, he's riding his fucking motorcycle with I no helmet on the whole one. time. I, I totally fake. called that one. Uh, I'm like, come on, isn't bro. there states still that, like, no. Like, there's yes, there is. No, is there states? Oh, yeah, yes, there is. Oh, yeah. You don't have to in Nevada. Well, he's in San Diego. Yeah, I know. That's why I know okay. he's in San Diego. Yeah. That's why it was bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, so what made me... So in the 80s, was that not a law in California? No. I don't know. It must not have been no. because they shot... The, well, the original was shot in the 80s. Bro, right? in the 80s, you could put your kids in the pickup truck in the back <laughs> with no seat <laughs> on the rope sometimes, you know, or that was, a seat belt. That was only if a parent was being trying to be nice. Yeah, like, like laws, dude. Yeah. You know, I used to drive... Literally, my dad would take me in his pickup truck on the freeway. We'd be sitting in the back with the dog, driving, yeah. brrr, and he'd have the window open. Good old case. days. They, yeah. they would teach you literally, like, put your arm out to stop somebody from hitting the, the windshield. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save you. We don't need a seatbelt. My grandma anyway, used to do that too. The me. movie was so fun. The <laughs> The dog fights were just exciting. My daughter, who's never seen the first one, she loved it. Okay. So be, be honest. Though. Was it, I mean, because it got it like a 98 and like a 97. And so many people told me it was so amazing when I watched it. And it was. But. Was it really that amazing, or did it just do such a good job of playing into nostalgia for you? Both. Oh, yeah. both. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, think, you think it hit nostalgia really well, and it was such well, a good Well, look, movie. my daughter has- Yes, yeah, the testament of the new people. My daughter has no no interest in yeah. fighter jets, yeah, no true. interest in military stuff, no interest in the movie, never saw the first one. Yeah. And I you know, I took her, it's a movie with dad, and you know, we're going to eat food, so it'll be fun. 
And afterwards, she was like, that was good. That was really good. That was fun. So it was well made. It was exciting. It's cool to see, you know, Maverick come back and, you know, I don't know, maybe some spoiler alerts, but he, you know, I, I like the, I love the storyline, maybe because I'm older now, of the old guy coming back, teaching the young kids, you know, what time it is, yeah, which yeah. he did it many times. Yeah. So I'm kind of rooting for him. Like, show these kids. That was they're... the best scene for me. Yeah. Yeah. When they got into training and he was training all the, yeah, young, just all the, young, yeah, the young cocky <laughs> yeah. guys. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. totally like the old guy in you, right? So, <laughs> so you know what it did for me? Still the best. You yeah. know what it did for me that I know, <laughs> that I know so many people did when I was done, because they talk about fifth generation fighters. And then they talk about the F-14 Tomcat, which is now a relic. They retired it in 2006 and yeah. all this stuff. I looked it up. So I'm like, oh, shit, I'm interested. So I looked up. There's all these articles. Apparently, lots of people are looking this up. I looked up, can a fifth generation, can a F-14 Tomcat, which is at the end of the movie, he he gets one and then he flies and he, has to, and he ends up fighting two fifth generation. And they're Russian. I can't remember the name of them, but the Russian they're fifth generation. Migs. Yeah. No, no, MIGs are the older ones. That was the old one. Those are the old ones. The Tomcat was designed to kill, to destroy MIGs, and it did yeah. a very good job of that. Right. By the way, did you guys know that there's a country that still flies F-14 Tomcats? You want to guess? What country um, it is? Yeah. We, re we, reti uh. we, we retired it in 2006. And we gave it to them? No, what? Iran. Yes, uh, we did give it to them. Uh, that's why I was saying Remember in we the, gave them. In yeah. the 80s, Iran was our friend. Iron they Eagle? They, is that when I, Iron, Iron Eagle dropped Eagle. off? No. Oh. No? No, I don't know. That was no. like, no. You, know, you never saw Iron Eagle? That was like no. the step kid what? of no. Tom. You've never seen Iron Eagle? Top no. Gun. No, I've never seen You have no. seen what? it? Yeah, of course. Oh, Doug? I don't think so. What? No. Oh, my God. You have to go home tonight and watch Where that. Where he goes okay. and saves like his Top Gun knockoff. It's, I mean, I actually liked Iron Eagle as a kid more than I even liked Top Gun. Dare I say that? Right, because well, Top it was Gun a kid, is kid, right? You probably like identify totally. it as a kid, like yeah. going to save your dad. It's a some... it's a kid who actually uh, grows up in an Air Force family, and yeah. dad gets captured. Some military base. Oh, it's and... one of those realistic stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a kid, Come on, guys! Yeah, a kid flying a jet goes in and gets his dad. Right, so <laughs> and he plays his little yeah. Walkman. You know, yeah, the whole time. and the, the like... soundtrack. Is, I remember. The soundtrack I mean, I remember the yeah, picture. Yeah. Nineteen eighty six. Wow. But anyway, all the other ones are whack. The follow-ups are just a play on the because it had a cult following. But yeah, anyway, we we gave him to Iraq. Not, I'm excuse me, Iran. Not when he fought Iraq, but I forgot which whether the war. But we gave it. So they actually fly someone. But anyways, I looked up. Can an F-14 Tomcat actually beat a fifth generation fighter? Because in the movie, they're talking about it's the pilot, not the plane, right? right. So and he's a badass pilot and whatever. So I looked it up, and there were all these military experts commenting on it, and they're like, "Hell no, not even never." Hell no. And so one guy <laughs> not goes, even a great pilot. No, so that doesn't even, even matter like that. No, and you know why? Why? Because the fifth generations. This is what one guy wrote. He's like a, and this guy's a fighter pilot. He goes, "I will, I will be in the air, and I'll fire at you before you even know I'm there." Yeah, because I can, I can get you. We can lock in on you. I can get you from so far, far away. away. You won't pick me up. You won't even know yeah, I'm there. That's why it's silly. He goes that he goes. You'll know I'm there when you're dead. That when you're in heaven, they'll be like, "Oh shit, I got shot down." And how many of those like missiles did he do that like that that rooster flare thing? Oh, the and, flares. And blew, like that might work once. Yeah, it, maybe if you're lucky, right? I know there's how no way you could. I, how effective are those? At, I at, don't think yeah. there's no way, dude. Yeah, I didn't uh, know that. That's yeah. So, oh yeah, they, they you wouldn't even know. So like, it, so now, is it? It's a radar thing that you can't pick. Radar, up? the distance, the locking, the 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 technology that by the you would never know I was even there. So if we're in a dog fight, you're you're it'd be like me and you fighting. So I another, in other words, uh, like the, the Tomcats were were built to be a, in a dog fight and the new fifth generation is like you're not even you you don't get in a dog fight. You're supposed to be able to kill them from far away. From far away. Far they, away. they 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 made remember they made each generation of fighter they made to completely, you know, I, and so I was reading articles on this. The technology that they create makes the previous like undefensive technology completely Obsolete, yeah. like within a decade. Well, they don't even need fighter pilots now. No, that's the that's. I, I mean, they kind of alluded to that Dude, movie, wanted... which was you know that's where it's going. It's yeah. all going drones. Yeah, yeah. that's. Yeah. I was They'll I was listening. I was ground. listening to that that interview with the Palmer Palmer Lucky. I think is his, his name. The guy who did Oculus, and now he's I forget the name of oh. his company for his defense company. And that's you were telling me. And there, so I guess China is like way ahead of us with AI and everything like that. Like we've been, we're way behind on defense when it comes to like artificial intelligence and drones and shit like that. Mm. And that's a lot of their focus is like anti drones. Like now they have they they're ahead of us on the technology as far as what the what the drones can do. But nobody right now is building like a very good defense against against other drones and so i mean i don't the jets the carriers those things are, are going to be obsolete in the future well, like, why the, would you even sacrifice a potential life 
when you could go fly in, something that in the movie um they hit nine g's did you hit nine g's yeah 9.3 okay. <laughs> that's insane I so know, as we're watching it's it, it insane I, I don't know how to articulate that at, yeah. at, in the in the movie they, they hit nine g's and you could see one of them passes out or whatever one of the guys and so i'm explaining to my daughter because she's like oh my god like what is that like what is that? i said do you know justin so I, I did remember properly so i'm like justin hit nine g's i said we had some fans that flew in those exhibitions with jets and he got to ride up in one and he hit nine G's and she goes, what did he say it was like? I said, he said it was like every atom and molecule in his body. <laughs> like being being compressed. And, and, <laughs> yeah. he, he, and she goes, obliterated. Oh. She goes, why didn't you do it? I'm like, I don't want to go through that. And she goes, it's just not a big deal. You feel sick and you feel better. I said, he didn't feel right for like three, four days. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Remember you told me it's true. And it, the thing is the time length in between of forgetting, right? Like you're like, ah, oh, you know, I, I feel like, I, and the worst part is I was all gung ho after watching Top Gun again. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah. Like I, I would love to do that again and try and beat that last uh, score I got or whatever and like go for more G's because, um, well, so they showed that uh, they, they were trying to allude that, that Tom Cruise got like 10 G's by like pushing it with that, that next generation wow. jet, right? And I'm like, no fucking way, dude. Oh, and now do you know that the, the, the plane that he's working on in the movie- what is it? A Mustang? Is that a piece of Mustang? <clears throat> yeah, that's his actual plane. It is. Yeah, he owns that. Yeah, I knew he. I knew he like has a, a license and he has his own plane. Yeah, some so of so planes. certain planes, even though they're obviously obsolete and whatever, the the they're considered some of the best of all time. the The Mustang is one of them because it was so much better than all the other planes at the time. And, uh, and, and, and so was the F-14. I was going to say, I thought so the F-14 had, or 16 was like The that. F-14 was like that. F-14 was Navy, F-16 was Air Force. Right? Uh, yeah. I think, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure. But I know that the F-14 got in dogfights and was just supposedly, it, would, it was really it was really good compared to its competitors. That's it right Force. there, Doug? That's the- And he yeah, owned, that was his P-51. actual plane in the movie? Yeah, the one that he's working on. Oh, the uh, P-51 Mustang. Now, if he can fly that, that did they allow, would they allow him to fly the jets? Did he ever get to fly any of the jets? Oh, I have no idea. Do you know, a very different Justin? plane. Yeah, I I don't know. Like, I think I, I feel like they might have, um, you know, shot some footage of him, but like nothing crazy. I Doug, would imagine. What did the P fifty one fight? What was the Japanese plane? Were they called Zeros? The Zeros, I believe. Is that what they called? Yeah. yeah so, and I were- do find it a bit ironic that Tom Cruise was yelling at people on the set about not wearing a mask, <laughs> but wasn't wearing a helmet in the motorcycle. That's what I'm saying. What's the what's the risk factor there? They're like way higher, you be right? way higher. invisible. Yeah, yeah. way higher. He yeah. had Jennifer Donnelly on there with him. What are you doing, bro? <laughs> Connolly, yeah. Donnelly. Did I say your name? And you're risking another life. Connolly is it Connolly or Donnelly? No, Connolly. Is Connolly? Con- Connolly, I believe. Yeah. You might Did you pick up, up on that? How they incorporated that character, the female that the, that he's you know kind of like got a, a romance with. Mm-hmm. So in the first one, she's. She's referenced in the first one. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's a scene in the bar. You know when they're playing Great Balls of Fire and they're having a good is time it with the Admiral's daughter. Or no, what? no, no. And they're and they're playing Great Balls of Fire. And Meg Ryan is yeah. like with them and stuff. She's razzing him about how he's such a you know ladies man and all the girls. Oh, and they mention and that. she mentions her name. Oh, yeah, because I think it's like a friend of hers, and it might be an Admiral's daughter. I don't remember wow. that or not, but. I know, like she referenced because I went back and watched the first one again. Because like, where did this girl come now, from? Now, yeah, Val- I thought they just like like extracted her from Rocketeer. Like, oh, yeah. No, no, she was a re- she was referenced in the first one, so they did a good job of even tying it back to that. Like she was like a a girl that he went back and hooked up with multiple times. They did their homework. Oh, they did. They yeah. did a good job. Val Kilmer. Now, Val Kilmer, who plays Iceman in the first one, right? He. He can't actually speak. can't talk, right? Yeah, that's what you no, see yeah, scarf, his scarf around right? his neck. Oh, so that, he that does one that? of those, has one of those, uh, what do you the call trach. it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that, the interesting, I actually read, uh, I think it was like um, a tech magazine, like did a thing on it. They had to, so that was his voice on some level, but they had to patch it all together digitally, I, I guess. That's through, sad, Through man. artificial intelligence. So that way it was like, it strung it all together. So it wasn't really like, he, he was performing it, but I believe that, you know, they dubbed over it with- um, he never oh. talked. Yeah, he did no, talk he did. a little bit. He, he, he kind of yeah. real low. At the oh, very, like the very real, end, he was like, like real raspy. But real even raspy. that, like, I think they had to enhance it. Oh wow! Like, really? Using AI, yeah. Oh, interesting. interesting. I think it was so, Doug who saw his documentary. Did you watch his documentary? I did. It was very it was interesting. Sad. Very sad. Right. So, very may, sad Doug, look up fifth generation Russian fighter. So, uh, in the movie, they don't tell you where they're going. Or where, who, what kind of fighters they are on purpose. They don't say, like, it's here, it's there. Oh, I didn't pick up on that. Uh-huh. No, they didn't say any of that. But it's obviously Iran. 
and it's obvious, and those are Russian fighters. So Russian fighters who were given to Iran to support. So it's actually like I a, noticed that I was like, how did they make this such a neutral like uh, uh, adversary? Yeah, they're they're they're, like, what, they're, they're, they're pointing to like potential scenario, right? So that's definitely Iran, and that's that's the that was the fighter. What's it called? SU fifty seven. Yes, SU fifty seven is their fifth uh, fifth generation fighter jet. Now, which, they, by the way, is the worst fifth generation. I looked them up, so I, I know you guys know me. I'm a dwarf, right? So I went crazy. <laughs> Apparently, Dude. that's the worst fifth generation uh, uh So I don't know there. what we have in comparison to it, but when I was at the air show, they Raptor, had like their- Yeah, Raptor. Yeah, so they actually had one of those, so it lifts vertically, so you could actually see uh, the jet engine point down mm. and, and lift it up, well, and I then think it like a, hovers. Maybe that's a Hornet. Is that a, a Hornet? Harrier? Or a Harrier? No, I think it was a Raptor. Is Raptor? it? Yeah, I'm oh, pretty okay. sure. Wow. Yeah. I, you know what's funny? Finish telling me about sick, that. Though. What about you? Saw one? Didn't yeah, I saw one, and so it, would, it, it, it like it would go super slow with its, if with the front end up and just kind of hovered over everybody, and then went like. So it needs no, it needs no runway space. No, no it just lifts up. No. Why aren't they all like? No. That, okay. So hold on a second. No, know. it's not the. It's not the. Uh, it's not. You're talking about a different one, okay. and I think it's called. A Hornet, or put American fighter jet vertical takeoff. Yeah, um, this is not that. It's one. a different. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. That, that it tripped me out though. I was just like, so wow. I've seen look that. At, yeah, because oh, you, you only too? think of I helicopters. I've never being seen able one of these. They're loud as hell, dude. Two. So the 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 the, the it's an engines F thirty five B. Okay, is that what it is? Whoa. Yeah, yeah. You see how it's pointed down like that? Lightning yeah. too. So. It, and then it um, adjusts, yeah. and then they just go supersonic. So uh, apparently, the the jets now are not designed. They're all designed for air to ground. They're not really designed for dogfights because it's kind of like it's you there's know, no yeah you know because the technology Point, is so advanced. Yeah, right. they're going to hit each other. They're more concerned with long range missiles and everything. Yeah. Now, right? now, if you ever have you guys ever read about the dogfights that happened in World War II, those are crazy. Yeah. Like literally, they're close and they're circling around each other and outmaneuvering each other and shooting machine guns. They didn't have missiles, yeah. And it was like crazy skill against crazy. Is it skill. World War One or World War Two with uh, uh, the Red Baron? That's one. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the bi, the bi, the, the bi, two. yeah, the biplane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were, yeah, those were the days. Yeah, right? <laughs> those, those <laughs> yeah. were the days. Yeah. Did you, day, did you right? by Doug? yourself? Yeah. Did you no, I went my daughter. Oh, you with your daughter? Yeah, That's yeah, what you yeah, say. yeah, yeah. Just no. you and her, huh? Just her and I. Yeah. Dom Dingo. No, he's already watched it. Oh, he already saw yeah, it. Yeah, so I, oh, I would have watched it again. It was, it was good enough to watch it. I mean, especially in theater. It was definitely a theater movie. Yeah. I'm glad I watched it in the theater. Yeah, it's yeah, like one of like, yeah. You know what I hate, though? Oh, God, I hate it when this happens because I'm torn on what I need to do. We sit down in the theater, and I'm sitting next to, and this happens to me sometimes, the most obnoxious people of all time. There's this couple over there. Just They're talking like normal volume, and the uh, guy has to comment every damn thing that happens in the movie. Uh, and I'm with my daughter, so I'm like, you oh, throw popcorn at so, them. So like, do I want to say because no, some I've done this before where I turn my head and I go keep it down right and then but I'm like, what if he, what if he says something? I got my daughter here and whatever. So smash like, his face. Yeah, right like, in front of her. yeah, like yeah. Uh, I remember. Yeah, years ago. <laughs> you want to know something funny? Years ago, I went to the movies. Got to put him in the hospital. I went to the movies <laughs> and somebody, somebody did that and they were loud. Yeah. And I said, "Hey, keep it down." And he stood up and then I pushed him into the curtains and then he sat back down. <laughs> it was, hey, here's the best part: people in the theater applauded. They're like, like twenty people clapped but after I did that. And I'm like, all right, well, I hope that's the end of it. Because <laughs> you have the curtains on the side or whatever. Sometimes you need a bouncer. I guess. I push him into the curtains. He yeah. fell back. That's what you just got. You know, I was so surprised by the price to rent out the whole theater. Oh yeah, I anticipated that to be way more expensive. Like it, I would have, I would have. What thought, is it like three hundred fifty bucks? Or yeah, like small theater. Yeah, to have you and your family. I mean, damn, the way tickets are like twenty bucks ahead. You you go with five people, you're already halfway there. Yeah, damn near. You know what I'm saying? Your whole family and you split it. Yeah, up. you nothing. go you and you, like if I were to go with you three, and then we all have our family. Now, you know what us. we should do? You know what we should do? Rent it out. No, the net. Yeah, but the next. You know, there's like every once in a while, there's a movie comes out that we're all excited about. Yeah. We should anticipate that and book it. I want to. I want to go. I want to take the kids to go see Minions. It comes out July first. Oh, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Minions is always good. Yeah, Minions that'll be great. a fun. That'll be a fun one, and it's like we could take the kids. All is there it. any good movies that we like though that's coming out soon? Well, I mean, this Avatar, but I'm not. I mean, I, yeah. I'll, yeah. I mean, I definitely want to see that in theater in 3D because it's like just a visual. Why are you net about it? Do they go well, like shoot even more well? I like no. Originally? I like that. I like Avatar. I'm just it's great. I don't but know. Yeah, it was a movie based wise. based off the visual. You know what yeah. I mean? Like the story was okay, 
but it was predictable story. It was yeah. the visual that it was all about, and I, I like to have a good story. So it wasn't a bad movie. Well, you got to think, it. with it's James Cameron doing it again, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you would think that he's got to he push the boundaries again, right? I mean, yeah. that was what made it so great was, you're right, it was like, visually, it was- and it was creative. I believe they shot like three in a row, like- uh, over that's over that right time, you're so. right i remember that what they did already they, so they've already had yeah, this so they for, haven't banked oh like, so then that, that also kinda, what kind of sucks about that is that it's not going to have probably the cutting edge stuff well, that's it. what i mean it's like leading into the next mm. uh which also knows, i i better. it just doesn't sit with me well that the dude sold out the human race for some <laughs> for some <laughs> alien tang like what do you well, know, i don't know maybe makes up for it in this one i don't know it's yet to be seen but we'll see how it goes yeah, tang okay. will make you do crazy things <laughs> alien <laughs> Lifting that tail up. Yeah. You know. I know. Oh, whoa, dude. Too, too far. What? No. Oh, no. Too what? Far, hey, I'm just, I'm just, recounting what happened in the movie, That's where the tail, the tail's yeah. coming. God, uh, you guys have a sick mind, mind uh, dog. Uh, what are you thinking over there? Uh, this is this a bestiality? Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Good Lord. That's, this would be a good transition. Say hello. This is a hey good Lou. transition to talk about sausage. Yeah. So Butcher Box, <laughs> Butcher Box sausage <laughs> is delicious. Hey, have you guys get the sausage from Butcher Box? It's no, so it's delicious. It's really good. Gobble it up. It is really good. I actually, I actually haven't got it from there It's yet. good. Listen, okay. I like, <laughs> okay. Everybody's going to make fun of me. I, I'm a big sausage fan. <laughs> and you know. don't no, find, hey, nobody's surprised. You don't find nobody's good surprised. sausage at the grocery store. You just don't. It's always, always garbage. In, you're just eating them. It's just why. bad. Yeah. Butcher box sausage is really good. It's the it's, pork thing, right? It's the best. It's the best sausage that I found. I think they have the, I think they have the best ribs, hands down. For sure. It's got to be the heritage pork. But you got to do it yourself. You got to season it yourself. Because I did the, the preseason stuff. I'm not as happy yeah. as I am mm. doing it myself. There you go, Adam. Yeah. So, so you I have them for yeah. breakfast all the time. I have a negative commercial. <laughs> That's why sponsors get mad at Adam. I'm just saying. I was really excited about it. And it, I was I was let down a little bit. So I just got to keep it real with my audience. I did Well, it. it's not going to be as good as when it's pre when it's already made. You got to make it yourself. Yeah. I, but I was hoping it would be close. It's not even close. Like the ones I make that you guys have had mm. is like not even that's more out of convenience i think that's what oh it is i mean that it, what's nice it's already pre-cooked so if you yeah. were in a hurry and you really wanted ribs yeah. you heat it up and it is good for that it's yeah. i mean it's definitely better we than literally, going, going down to some rib place we literally had a sponsor once i'm not gonna <laughs> yeah. say who they are but oh, we had a sponsor once and they actually wrote us a letter because or not a letter an email because <laughs> adam's like great product tastes like shit i can't yeah. stand the way it, <laughs> it tastes, tastes like they're like please don't say that about our <laughs> I think it's working, but it's yeah, horrible. bro. When yeah. I set up all these partnerships, that's in the clause, dude. We, we you can't tell us how to say or talk about that's the product. That's the deal. You, we, we you pay us to mention it, we yeah. will mention it, but we'll keep it real. Yeah. If that's how I feel. Hey, about hey, you want to know what's funny? So you know how we did that episode about um, reasons why you should not become a personal trainer? Oh yeah, okay. you knew you called that. I predicted yeah, I, you this. called it. You called it because I know fitness massive. People. We laughed. So Sal came up with the idea. Okay, I'll give you your credit where it's due. You came up with the idea to do that episode, and we all kind of laughed like, "Oh, that's going to be great. We're going to tell people." not to become a personal trainer when that might be the future of our business and so i was like i already know what'll happen we're going to tell people not to it's going to motivate them to do it yes <laughs> every trainer and coach yeah. is sharing it right I'm now the on you know, it reminds you know it reminds me of like those motivational speeches when you when you go somewhere and the guy's like at the top and there's like 300 people on it only 10 of you yeah. are going to make it out if you're the yeah. rest of you going to fucking fail yeah. and everybody, everybody yeah. cheers yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's not talking about me yeah, yeah. yeah. no he's talking about you yeah. Yeah. no you know why because real trainers and real coaches, people who've been doing it for a long time, have a deep passion that resonated with everything we said. Sure, sure. Because no. they said, that's true, that's true, that's true. And that's why this is a hard job and most people can't do it. And yeah. then you feel proud that you're the one that does it, it and you love it. But yeah, people are sharing it like no, crazy. No, it was, it, was, it was accurate. Hey, I meant to ask you, um, you know, how's, because you're dad here, right? So, and we, you have now, it's been what? Dom's been here for a couple months now? Oh yeah, my boy. Yeah, has it yeah. been two? Is it two months now? He's yeah, been here. Yeah, I think so. So what? What, what are you feeling? Oh, he, are we gonna keep him? Are we gonna fire him? Do you yeah. think he's gonna be made for That's this? That's a good time <laughs> to tell him right now. So <laughs> yeah, he's no. gonna be editing this. <laughs> like, we're, like, we're letting you. We're he letting loves it. Letting pins off. and needles. Yeah. Yeah. He, he loves it. You know, he did, so you know, we all we had that meeting with everybody. We said, hey, show us when you guys do edits that are cool, whatever. So he pulls me in there and shows me. Oh yeah. Edits and stuff that he thinks are Bro. you know fun or whatever. Yeah. And he's making fun of us, which is perfect. Because it's. I think it's a great addition for anybody that watches this on YouTube. It's so much fun. Like, so we are doing this whole sappy, you know, tell everybody in the group like how nope. much you mean to us and all stuff. And then they thank God they they brought some levity and they turned you into like the Terminator. Yeah, the Terminator well, well. like I was like I was dying, dude. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That's yeah. perfect. Speaking yeah. of which, uh, that kid. I swear to God, man. So I I gave him blue light. I gave him some Felix Gray glasses. 
because he's on his computer late at night and it does mess with his sleep. He definitely can get insomnia. So I'm like, where are these? Okay. So yesterday I go to pick up my daughter because they're at their mom's right now and uh, he and he's taking a nap, right? It's like, this is like four o'clock at night. I'm like, what's going on? He comes out because he hears me say hi and I'm like, what's going on, dude? Did you sleep? Like, no, not, I'm not sleeping good. Oh, are you, where's your blue light blocking glasses? I can't find them. Come on, dude. Come on, bro. <laughs> you got to wear your blue light blocking bro, glasses. We need more of your son. We need more. Yeah, we need to be more of your son. I need to get more. Hey, don't give him. You know, let don't me give tell him. You, it let me tell you his what you idea, have to do. You don't give him leverage, him. Adam. The same yeah. thing that we have to do with you. You have to trick him into thinking it's his idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what you got to do. You can't tell him. We, to put we the blue actually light. discuss this all the time. How how can we make this Sal's idea? You know, like should we write it on the wall? Should we like little like subtle clues? Yeah, like subtle messages on on the table. What were we just at? We were just texting. Right in the last, sand. Was what are all last, these, last night it was about Andrew Schultz, right? First of all, Andrew Schultz, Justin yeah. found like when he was just coming up, right? Loved was, him, dude. Right? I was like reaching out to before him. Before Joe Rogan, before he got all famous and stuff like that, yeah. Justin was on him a couple years ago and was like, oh, check this guy out. I really like him. I started following him after that. <clears throat> Recently, I listened to an interview that Andrew Schultz did with Logan Paul. I think I even brought it up on the show. You did. I did, did yeah, I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, I talked about him like that. And then yesterday, you know, in the thread, Sal was like, check this out. Oh, you know, it's Andrew Schultz doing an interview <laughs> looking for. <laughs> Motherfucker, where were you when we were all talking about this? I know you thing? guys had talked <laughs> about it. He was right him. here in the room. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I know you guys have talked about it. I just hadn't seen him yet. And I agree. He's, yeah. uh, he's really hostile. <laughs> it just like entered in there. You yeah. Know, just all of a sudden it's like, There's like those like magnet letters on the fridge. What yeah. does this say? Yeah. 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 Oh, wait. That's a good idea. You think we're, <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> joking? We, anyway, we're I got to get him another pair of Felix Grays. So that's. Yeah. Uh, you, do you guys? I have a few pair. I actually, I think I have them up to like four or five pairs. Yeah. If you have another one to spare. Yeah. Give it to uh, our newest editor. No, I do. I really. I. I, I don't. Which ones? Does, do you know which ones he wears? Oh gosh, I forgot. Uh, I can't Got remember. Two he'd probably be Nash. I would think. I would, think maybe. I would think he'd be Nash because yeah. he's he's got a smaller head. I don't think yeah. he's got a big head. Yeah, he, he not just the, the, the fat face. Like a, a melon hey, head. Hey, you guys. Cranium. You guys want to hear a funny study that I read today? A funny one. Well, of it's weird, right? So the scientists wanted to study if I don't know how they come up with these ideas. Sometimes, do people's sexual preferences, like in other words, who they consider attractive, do they change if a person's hungry versus if they're fed? Oh, that, <laughs> that's interesting. So that's, that is funny. So they took people. I know my grocery shopping changes. Well, we're not. You know, well, okay. So here's where they came up with the idea. Because at first you're like, what? Why would they come mm. up with that? Lots of behaviors apparently change if you're hungry. Or if you're fed, not just grocery shopping, but lots of different behaviors tend to change because getting food is so wired into us because for most of human history, that was a big problem oh, that if you didn't have food, your body and your brain would change your behaviors in a way to like get are you. you attracted so to are you types of physiques? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to like, can we speculate on yes. like, yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to speculate that the hungrier you are, the more promiscuous you are. Well, no, because the way I would think evolutionary, you are like, oh shit, I might not eat ever again. I might die. So I need to. Uh, Make it happen. Yeah, I need, yes. to, I need to have a baby. Okay, so so that's not what they tested. What they tested uh, was preference. Like, like more thickness. Damn. Yeah, because you're Justin hungry. Justin hit it. On the, on the, he hit the you like more up. thickness? Yeah. Pre so so you, you would go for someone who looks like they have extra calories He's a little heavier. Spare. Oh, like, yeah. wow. They're hiding some when you're hung, When you're hungry. <laughs> when you're hungry. So when you're hungry, your your tendency is to pick uh you know partners that appear to be a little bit rounder, a little bit heavier than if you're Shut fed. Shut up. Wow. Yes. Now this makes evolutionary sense because if you have trouble finding food, you want to mate with someone that is going to be able to at Dude, least looks like they and, and can take care of the food. baby a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. I ain't got food. Oh, you got some food on you. Looks like so you'll be able to take care of the baby. Now, there's another study. A milkshake brings the boys to the yard. Yeah, yeah, there's another study that's kind of related that shows that the more stressed you are, so if you have high levels of stress, yeah. you're more likely to seek out women who are thicker and heavier than if you're not very stressed, then, you, then you're okay with thinner, skinnier hmm. people. And I think it's similar because stress was so closely related to food, so they think they might be kind of connected. So, Wild. I know, right? That is kind of fascinating. Now, is this like controlled study where they're they're showing them images? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they, they would take the people, and feed them. them of food. Yeah, or feed them feed or them, then yeah. fast them and then they'd show them different images and they would digitally change the face to make it a little heavier, a little yeah. skinnier. And they what found- a trip. That's isn't hilarious. that funny? Yeah. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah, yeah that is hilarious. I know. So- <laughs> What an interesting so, I'm like, thing. how can people use this right to, to create leverage? <laughs> yeah, I know. You know what I mean? yeah, like exactly. you know, a girl and a guy, they link up on, <coughs> on what is that that app or whatever the dating app? Yeah, and she's like, oh man, I want him to find me attractive. She's like, hey, uh, 
you should fast all day because uh, I'm going to take you to a nice restaurant later <laughs> on. Okay, I would eat all day long. Well, I've always thought it's fascinating how we all have, like, everyone has a unique type uh, that they're, they're like, uh, attracted to. And it's, you know, how much of that is, like, things like that? How much of that is, like, you know, born into you already before you even got to a place where you were attracted to other, other people? Yeah. Like, when, like, how did that all develop? Is some of it experience, too? Like, is it is it's it nature and nurture? Is so it it's a combination, and the, the <clears throat> there are some some commonalities worldwide, but they're not, but, like, size varies dramatically. So, in, like, and they did this with women. So in some countries, you know, it's preferable that women are smaller, in other countries, much bigger. And so scientists were like, well, what, what's the evolutionary, like, what, what do we have in common? It's the hip to waist ratio. So whether you weigh 180 pounds or you weigh a hundred pounds, the hip to waist ratio was the same in all these countries. And so, and they, and why they connect that to successful childbirth. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, so, but, but culture does influence size. Some cultures like them heavier, some cultures like them. What about things like even like hair color and eye color and skin tone? Like what, what makes us more attracted to healthy? That? So healthy skin. Uh, so skin <clears throat> teeth, it was skin teeth. And I forgot there was another one. So if you have healthy teeth, uh, so like a healthy smile probably hair and too. healthy skin, um, but why? Because those are those will signal to you disease. Mm. Like in for most of human history, if you met someone with missing teeth, they're probably not, they're probably not well, healthy. I'm sure too. There's some Freudian stuff in there in, in terms of like it, it relating to how you grew up and like your mom, your mother, on right? Some level, yeah. Well, I mean. Jeez, it's the see. gross thing to talk about. I know. <laughs> it's true, Just though, right? Like I mean, mom, me they say that a lot of times that you end up, you know, dating or marrying your mother, and the same thing for women marrying and dating their their father, right? Yeah. Like a like someone that has well, similar I mean, attributes. Or whatever, I don't know. Right? I mean, I think so. I know for me, it's like so. Right now, um, and I think I think that has less to do with like your mom or your dad, and more so that that's what you connect to what is normal and healthy. Partly, right? if yeah. you're if you're raised, and let's say, let's take the bad example of that right, and you have your 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 father was abusive to your mother, and you have that. And a lot of times, people fall right in that they end up marrying well, because so, they tolerate it. Because exactly, yeah. they 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 recognize that as normal behavior. Whereas if the opposite was true, they didn't have that. They yep. would see that as normal, and maybe they're they're less tolerable to somebody who is willing to you do know the, that. So I think it's less to do with like, oh, I'm attracted to a woman that looks like my mom, and it's more like the there's attributes, yeah, there's and characteristics traits. and attributes yeah. about her that I recognize. Which that goes back to uh, the book Hitmakers, and I tell you guys that there is in human psychology there is this part of us that we want familiarity. Yeah. Like as much as we love novelty, which is was true, we also want familiarity with things. And so, mm. okay, I want this a different. I obviously don't want my mom. I want something different. But then there's things that I want to be familiar. Like oh, yeah. the, I love the way that she used to cook, or the way that she used to, you know, hold me or hug me. I want someone that's affectionate. Like so, you start to gr gravitate well, towards those I, maybe. I mean, me. for me, I find um, <clears throat> motherly. Uh, actions and stuff like that so attractive. And my, but my mom, I mean, she was a mother of four kids. I'm the oldest, so I saw her take care of three babies. My mother's very motherly. So like right now, Jessica's pregnant. She's got Aurelius with her. And right now she's on vacation. She's sending pictures. And she's so, to me, so beautiful. I don't know if it's the motherly thing or what the deal is or the energy, uh, but I find her so attractive. You know, what's interesting about those studies, uh, studies on that, Adam, is <clears throat> girls that don't have a secure male role model. So that don't have like a secure dad that's there or don't have a secure relationship with the male. <clears throat> they are typically far more promiscuous as they get older. And the theory is, is that they, throughout human history, a female required a male for protection, especially if she got pregnant. And if she didn't have one nearby, her, her having sex or sex was a way to attract. So they become more promiscuous to try to get that connection and that security from other men really you know so the, all the jokes you know about daddy issues yeah, and right. stuff there's a little bit of truth sure that, yeah. that you know come to yeah, that of course yeah it makes yeah. me sad when i talk about that kind of stuff oh really <laughs> yeah i mean it, it should just motivate you to be a good dad right I think oh that's what, of course you know, right i think that's what you, it just I, makes me sad for other people thing. yeah oh yeah. yeah for the people that unfortunately didn't have i mean you can have the pot uh, there's there's also the the positive side to that i mean i i'd like to think that i'm an example of that right statistically speaking with my father having suicide and the, the childhood that i grew up in I, I was supposed to go down a bunch of other paths but if you become aware, I think, like I, I became aware at a pretty early age. Yeah, you're an anomaly for sure. You, you, you know, and I actually think it worked to my advantage because I was so adamant about going the opposite direction. I didn't want to go down that path. I was consistently, 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. reflecting and paying attention to my behaviors and the mm-hmm. things that I tended to be drawn to, knowing that, okay, I grew up in this environment and these are the things that I think are normal, but they're not, and they're not healthy. Therefore, I need to be re- very active, like proactive about, you know, where where I, you know, let my life be influenced in the future. And so there's some positive yeah. things that can happen. Yeah, I was all, uh, in the same article that I was that I just told you about the with girls and promiscuity, they talked about boys and not having a strong male role model um, and a good connection with a, with a man or a father that boys um, what they learn from a strong ro- uh, male role model is temperance. They learn a lot of temperance meaning boys or men can be out of control, aggressive you know like hypersexual Chaotic, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and ha- having a strong male role model shows you to be controlled, temperate, to have to, uh, responsible. That was the other one thing, responsibility yeah. because we don't have a biological clock that says, you know, by the way, if you ever watch little boys and little girls play, I know I'm being stereotypical, but generally speaking boys and girls play differently. Girls play like they're already taking on responsibility. Boys play like they're breaking shit and going crazy or whatever. Yeah. And so they, what they learn from their dads or from male role model is responsibility, temperance, um, boundaries and, too. And if they, yeah, and boundaries. And if they don't have that, what they do is they look at media yeah. for examples of masculinity. And what does ma- media tell you? Oh, you know, be aggressive, bang lots of chicks, you know, no responsibility, just make money, like whatever. And so they end up having this kind of like what they call toxic masculinity, this hyper machismo that's not even good i mean that's why rough and tumble is so important like with your oh, yeah. your kids right like it's I, you know i i knew that going into being a father because i'm older and i and i understand that but it's not like i actively think about that when i do it it's i find it very interesting how it's almost animalistic in us and how i naturally mm-hmm. just yeah. do that like it's not when i go and wrestle with my son i don't go like oh i should do this you know, mm-hmm. now there might be some fathers that need to do that because maybe they weren't trained or taught yeah. to do that, or it's not normal, natural. But I find it very natural. It's so funny that it's like it's just if my son comes over, it's just it's natural yeah. for us to right away start well, wrestling. It's yeah. a trip because you see, uh, and I've I've noticed this myself because I've you know done a lot of like wrestling and whatever, and like trying to like get rough to the point where it's it's borderline. But but they know I'm never going to hurt them. Right. Yeah. And so that's the whole thing is that's like trust. figuring out like where that lies in terms of like uh, where it's really going to hurt or, you know, you can put damage on somebody. And so therefore, when they get into these kind of scuffles with their friends and they can just play yes. fight and all that, they know where that lies, that boundary lies. But I've noticed some of their friends that don't have that kind of interaction, didn't grow up with a lot of they freak out and then they'll go too hard and then they yes. actually will throw a punch or like, you know, they'll, they'll do violent things. Things that go beyond the boundaries. They don't know how to. They don't know how to. Um, how to. How to. What the boundaries are. What the limits are with play. Because what happens with your boys when you wrestle with them? Inevitably, when they're little, what do they do? They'll hit you in the eye or something, and then you'll stop. Say no, 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 don't mm-hmm. do. Or they'll bite you. No, no, no. We're not going to play like that. You got to be a little bit more gentle. And then they learn those boundaries. And then with girls, when you rough and tumble with your daughters, they learn that they can be physical with a man and it be safe. Yeah, and it not be whatever. So they're comfortable with a man that is showing them that they can trust them or whatever. Um, so that's also why it's important to Super important. wrestle with your daughters. Yeah, yeah, so that they know that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, totally. really, yeah, really, really cool stuff. So hey, did you guys know that they they are pretty close to an HIV cure? Really? Yeah, I just read a study where they took a woman and through some gene therapy, her body actually eradicated the HIV virus. What? So we're getting close to a cure. Uh, for HIV. I mean, we've is, already got to a place though where it's like totally livable with now. Yes. Right? Like, I mean, that since the, the 90s when it was- Well, I mean, uh, Magic Johnson looks healthier than other people his age. How the hell that happen? I know. <laughs> I, it's so crazy too, right? Because he was right in the heart of it when it was really scary, but then obviously got a lot of the cutting edge- HIV stuff. was a death sentence before. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that who aren't- who When he got it, it was. Know that. Yeah. That was what was so crazy about it. And then we see where he's at now. I mean, it looks amazing today. Yeah, right? yeah. So anyway, pretty interesting. Exciting. Yeah. Hey, check this out. You got to check out a company called Olipop. So they make drinks that are healthy for your gut. They're only 35 calories, but they taste like the sodas you drank when you were a kid. I'm not making this up. They're delicious, but they're good for your gut. Almost no sugar, only 35 calories, no artificial anything. Go check this company out. Now, I recommend their variety pack. It's a great way to try out all the flavors like root beer and vintage cola, strawberry vanilla, orange squeeze, cherry vanilla, Ginger lemon, classic grape, um, and tropical punch. That one's my favorite. 
Go check this company out. Get the variety pack. See which one you like. I promise they won't let you down. Great company. Go to drinkolipop.com. That's drink, O-L-I-P-O-P.com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump and get 20% off plus free shipping on your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from the Jillian Warwick. Other than doing a dumbbell bench press, what are the best moves to improve and increase your barbell bench press? Okay. All right, to be clear, nothing is going to get you better at your bench press than practicing the bench press more. There's, there's, there's specificity when it comes to strength. So that's always number one, right? If you want to get better at the bench press, you need to practice the bench press more often. Practice doing maybe pause benches, different types of techniques, rep ranges, intensities, that grip, kind of stuff. Wide grip. But this person is obviously pointing to like other exercises or movements that may contribute to the barbell bench press. They mentioned the dumbbell bench press. I think that's a good one. I think the incline press for a lot of people makes a big difference. I think I think what is most novel for you for the chest is going to if you've been a lifter for a while right this is we're, we're going to assume this person's been lifting for a while and they've probably hit a plateau on their bench and they want to increase their barbell bench press they already do it consistently in their routine what else can i do i think some of the most novel exercises related to uh your chest that you don't do right so that's what I mean by what i mean by novel right so if you don't let's say uh and i know justin's a huge advocate of this exercise uh and it's not something i commonly use is like really deep dips oh i was gonna say that yeah. <laughs> I, I knew you were so yeah. <laughs> and it's not something that i would do it was my content right yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh my my point is i mean they, it aligns because i don't think a lot of people think to do deep dips for yeah. increasing your bench mm -hmm. strength but and, and so it's a novel exercise and really that's more so than it being magical because it's deep dips it's because not a lot of people do it the reason why incline bench press took my regular bench press through the roof because i avoided it because i sucked at it mm -hmm. when i was in my teenage years early 20s i hated incline bench because it took me forever to get the big wheels on the flat bench and I, there was no yeah, way you're not gonna do the quarters. i was not going to drop down in the quarters so it t i waited until i was benching over 225 on the flat bench to even go to incline yeah. bench where i could at least do the wheel on there yeah. it took me a but I to i've told this story on the podcast before the most the most chest development and the biggest and strongest my chest ever was uh, with barbell bench pressing was when I went on a kick for about a year of I my goal was can I catch my incline bench up with my flat bench mm -hmm. and so I inclined incline dumbbell press incline bench press all the time and the the thought process as a trainer at that point was. I knew that I neglected that. I knew that I didn't do those movements that often. In fact, that was back in the days when I was even doing decline bench press because it was easier and I could do more weight. Mm -hmm. So I did a decline and I did flat and I occasionally did some incline work, but I didn't like to because it was hard. So mm -hmm. it was so beneficial because it was so novel. I think yeah. that's the key here. Well, speaking of novelty, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a different angle to this whole thing, which I... Is another one of my kind of go-tos in terms of like if we're talking about stability of the shoulder in general and like what we tend to neglect n neglect that's, that's mm -hmm. a new word for your library <laughs> uh, neglect um to, to neglect the most rotation and, and so that's just mainly from the perspective of uh trying to keep your shoulder in, in track and support it right so if i have um, any kind of of lateral stability issue if i'm in my bar path or uh, just any kind of, uh, taking me out of that, out of that good bar path line, um, you know, to, to have my muscles respond accordingly, uh, is massively beneficial for performance. So to work on rotational movements for me, I, I bring up Indian clubs. It doesn't have to be that exotic. Like you could just take, you know, a dumbbell and do some kettlebell, kettlebell or dumbbell halos, uh, around, uh, your head and just get like more external rotation of the shoulder, uh, to be able to respond and, and to, uh, you know, Keep your keep your shoulders in a good optimal position, so that way you perform yeah. better. In your That's because that typically tends to be the weak link with people, average person, right? Yeah, when they I, yeah, I love person. I love that tip because I actually was was late in my career. It wasn't until we started hanging out you got me to do Indian clubs, mace way more and i wasn't at the time thinking anything to do with my bench press but that's actually what i noticed i noticed the strength because i had now had so much mm -hmm. better stability shoulder stability that my benching would got better yeah. and it wasn't what i was thinking i was doing it for good shoulder health and shoulder mobility and i was trying to incorporate that but as a side effect i noticed that my bench became more stable and i got stronger yeah. the, there. the the best in my experience the best non-bench press exercises that have 
the best carryover to the bench press include close grip bench presses, incline presses, overhead presses. Overhead presses oh, tend to have a, big one. a really good, uh, decent carryover. You wouldn't think it because it's such a different movement, but especially when, I mean, on full range of motion. And if press. you add the stability component of uh, balancing it yep. overhead, because then you get that kind of shoulder strength stability that yep. we're talking about, what Justin's talking about, and then you still get that kind of upper chest to dig yourself out of the hole from yep. what you're talking about. Uh, you could do reverse grip pe presses and floor presses. Those are all really good powerlifting. Those are powerlifter auxiliary movements for the bench press yep. that powerlifters have identified to really have a decent carryover. But again, I, I, I do want to you know stress this. No matter what exercise you're doing, usually to get better at that exercise, you practice that specific exercise. Well, and you change the tempo and you change the rep ranges, and but you do that exercise itself. Well, hopefully, too, this person is going to or already owns MAPS Powerlift because this is what part of why we wrote it, too. If you're somebody who specifically wants to see an increase in your squat, deadlift, or your bench press, that's the program mm -hmm. for you. Because uh, that's a, that's something we none of us said, but it could also just be your programming. Yeah. So I don't know who, how you're creating your programming or whatever like that, but you know, just having just random times that you're doing your chest and there's no rhyme or reason of how you phase in and out, or if you're not doing anything like that with your, your programming, uh, it could be a programming issue that could totally get you out of it. So uh, MAPS Powerlift is specifically designed to bring up those three main lifts. So if that's one of your goals, that should be something you're trying out. Next question is from James Ayers 95. What are your thoughts on doing wall sits to help build the quads? You know, wall sits, when someone says that to me, so I don't think this fell out of favor, but when I first became a trainer, I hated them because Oh, they seem so pointless. Well, trainers would just throw them in all the time as a way for them to not train their clients. Yeah, it was and a kill time at the end of a session or yeah, something. Like, yeah, like, oh, here you go, do a wall sit. And it was they, hard. Yeah, and they just have them sit there and burn. So um, now that being said, if programmed properly, a wall sit really is an isometric. Yeah. And isometric exercises are excellent uh, for building strength and muscle at, in combination with traditional strength training. Now, I personally... The way that the, that trainers tend to program wall sits is at the end of a workout to fatigue someone. I like doing it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I like isometrics before going into full range of motion strength at training exercises because it helps connect better to the muscles in my experience. Right. Do that and then go over and do some front squats. Yes. And now you've lit up your, your quads and get them more responsive. I like that uh, as a tip. It's funny because... I feel like this exercise became what the plank became in terms of like yeah, yeah. a flex. Like, so people like start doing it for an exaggerated amount stacking of time, weights up. stacking weights on it. You see like stupid Standing videos, on each people other. on top of each other. Yeah. And I'm just like, are we supposed to be impressed? I, no, we're not impressed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like, just go do something that actually moves the needle uh, and work on, work on that. But I, it's not like an invaluable exercise for, I, I do see it as a good primer, at least for your quads to kind of get things going. Well, I think that's, I don't think any of us would program it as a standalone exercise to build the quads. I think we would use it to complement something of else. Course. Right. So a lot of like, like a squat, isn't just a quad exercise. You've got a, a lot of glute, you have hamstrings involved, right? You, you have cat, you have a lot of stuff that's going on in a, in a, like a barbell back squat or even a front squat. Quad, uh, but how could you put more emphasis on it being on the quads? Go do an isometric, you know, uh, wall sit mm -hmm. first, then go into that, and then you're really going to put a lot of emphasis mm -hmm. on the quads in that exercise. So that's a great way to yeah. to I think include it in there. But it, it by itself is not going to compare to a squat. It's not going to compare to a front squat. It's not going to compare to a lunge. It's not going to compare to a step up. It's not going to compare to a, a, a leg press. All those movements are going to, I think, build now, more, more muscle. And the other thing too with wall sits is it is they tend to create, it tends to turn into a isometric endurance movement, Iso which is fine if you're looking for isometric endurance. So like grapplers like isometric endurance when you're holding someone, right? So that's okay. But if you're looking to build strength and build muscle, you want to use isometrics the same way you use strength training with a high amount of exertion for a relatively short period of time, 10, right. 15 seconds. So if I did a wall sit and I wanted to build strength, I'd get in that position and I'd really squeeze, the squeeze hell and try to push my feet away from me That's a good point. for 10 seconds or even better, get underneath a bar that I can't move and, and try, try to, to move it, it yeah. and drive without moving, right? So it's an isometric drive for 10 seconds and then rest. Like yeah. that's more of a strength building, muscle building isometric. So just because it's isometrics doesn't mean it can't, it doesn't follow the same 
endurance strength you know type of path i'm and, so glad you, you know. brought that up because we we most see it commonly used as an endurance thing yeah how people, long you can how long it. can you sit there uh you know for a minute two minutes on the wall and how much weight can you stack on while holding for a minute two minutes on the wall you know and i think this became popular it's sports right so we do this in basketball. Now, in basketball, it makes sense to do that because the defensive position that you're trained to get into is you sit in an, in an isometric yeah. position and you're, mm -hmm. and you're sliding left to right. And that's a good – and guys were always tired and fatigued there. And coach would always be yelling at us, get your ass down, get your ass down, because you were tired. Your legs were tired from that isometric position yeah. of being bent at 90 degrees the whole time and getting down to play defense. So that exercise has tremendous application for an athlete – for in, in that example, mm -hmm. but for a client who's trying to build their quads, uh, doing a wall sit for three minutes is is not a, a good strategy. No. Next question is from Just Josh. If someone is starting off in their fitness journey with little to no experience, how would you introduce them to lifting weights? Uh, well, you know, of course, this depends on who I'm working with, but remember, strength training really is can be boiled down to this. It's using resistance, and it doesn't have to be external resistance. Oftentimes, it's not. Oftentimes, when you work with a beginner, it's their body. It's using resistance in a way to build muscle and build strength. So that typically looks like reps that are around 10, maybe 10 repetitions. You can be as high as 20 or so, but usually it's around 10 with a sufficient intensity. Of course, this is depends on the person's fitness level, but their beginner, you don't need much intensity to stimulate muscle and strength. So what does it typically look like with a total beginner? I'm doing a body weight squat with control. I'm doing a elevated push-up usually, not even off the floor, but rather on an elevated surface. Mm -hmm. I'm doing an elevated body row, either with you know suspension trainers or holding onto a bar that's higher than having them be perpendicular to the floor. I'm doing a very Sported light lunge, shoulder maybe. press or, or some kind of a split stance holding onto yeah. something for balance. It's really basic to and and it's it's appropriate for them and that will build strength and muscle. Now, could I take that person and put them on a leg press and put them on a bench press and, and and hammer them? I could, but not only is it going to not be appropriate, it actually will they'll progress slower. It's too much. So always consider that. It's how do I get this person to get stronger? Well, you do more than they're used to. If they're doing nothing now, that's not doesn't take much. Well, there's there's certain body positions that you have to be able to have control over first, and so I think that you know that's why body weight is is ideal. Uh, and isometrics uh, do help with this in terms of like at least working their way through that uh, communication and that recruitment process. So, uh, you know, having somebody in a split stance, you know, just maintaining that balance control, having somebody in a squat position, holding it down at the bottom, uh, you know, like working on these, um, you know, just basic things, elevated push-ups mm -hmm. and, and finding out where their depth um, uh, capability is there uh, an overhead position? Do they even have the ability to raise their arm over their head completely, not just in front, but completely over their head, uh, and and do that uh, with full support? So they're just like sort of checkpoints, joint by joint. Uh, you can do um, in, in terms of like their ability level, and then we start to load uh, those same positions a, as we move along. But um, you know, in terms of like keeping it, narrowing it down to like five, I try to really like not overwhelm people in the very beginning. So just like limiting it to three to five, like of the most basic movements you can. I think we talked about this yeah. in terms of like a dip, a, a lunge and what pull was up. the pull up. Yeah. yeah. Something like that where it's like, you know, you're, you're kind of covering the push pull and the legs uh, within just those three exercises that's going to move the needle the most. You know, the, the, the hardest thing to answer a question like this is that, um, <laughs> you know, it's like we, we kind of categorize people as like beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And it's like within each one of those categories is like 50 levels, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and yeah. what I mean by that is like, I've had somebody who's fresh off the street, haven't weight trained, done anything, ex really exercised in years or whatever like that. And been able to start them on a MAPS anabolic type of protocol, you know, especially if you count pre-phase, mm -hmm. right? And 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 move them in that direction because maybe they have an athletic background or they have they have good proprioception. Yeah. Or they're so they young good, and they can move. Young, good body awareness yeah. or whatever. And so so I would still categorize them as a beginner. Mm -hmm. They they haven't weight trained until they got to me, but they have enough body awareness and conditioning that I can get them there. Then I can have another beginner, okay, that starter 
is too much map starter, which is really does this person to me, I think is, is map starter the way we program that, mm -hmm. but it, they're even too deconditioned of that where our, our workout was getting up and out of a chair for yeah. the half, for a half hour, you know, and lots of breaks in between and uh, standing and balancing on one leg, yep. you know? So, and this is where I see like, you know, uh, we, and we're, we're, we've came out and, and made fun of the, the whole stability thing and how that was a kick you know, it's it's like anything in fitness. Like we, there is there's some really good value or truth to something, and then we we bastardize it, and then it then it falls out of favor. And I think that's what happened with stability too. I think there is some tremendous value in a lot of these kind of goofy stability exercises that people mock and make fun of because I think the wrong person is kind of doing it. But for someone that is really deconditioned and they can't, can't even balance on one leg, like that becomes an exercise. And I might include things like physio ball and Dyna disc and things like that to challenge this person's stability because that is already meeting them where they're at. Sal talked about like, where is this person at and meeting them there? Well, this person can't even stand on one leg. That's probably something mm -hmm. we should get be yeah. able to do before I care if this person can back squat 135 or overhead yeah. press a certain amount of weight. Map, map starter would be ideal for, I'd say, a, Most a good people. chunk of, of beginners. So if you're a beginner and you're watching this or you're a loved, loved one that wants to get started, that would be the program to start with. Next question is from Anasija Steph. How can I improve grip strength so I can hold heavy dumbbells when doing Romanian deadlifts without having to use straps? You know, the thing with grip strength and the reason why so many people, we get questions like this all the time. The reason why grip strength is an issue for so many people is the only time they ever t test or strengthen their grip is with exercises that where, where they need to have a stronger grip, like a deadlift or a Romanian lift. And usually they don't do enough of it to really to get the grip to catch up to the right. rest of the body. And I do want to be very clear, like our hands are meant to be extremely strong. I mean, we're, we're primates after all. I mean, maybe not like chimps, but we have hands that can really get strong if you train them appropriately. So if you want to get a stronger grip, it's as simple as, and we'll get into exercises too, but it's as simple as programming a few sets of grip exercises at the end of, let's say, an arm workout, really. And most people don't do that. Most people have zero hand or grip direct you know, forearm work anywhere in the workout and their hands are just as strong as they need to be to be able to support their their exercise oh, i was just going to throw a, a little fun fact in there that uh, did you know that the pinky and i think it's the ring finger were responsible for like 80 percent of your grip strength oh really yeah. interesting yeah so your thumb and pointer finger middle finger are more just for the dexterity of it and holding it in place oh but wow that's an interesting yeah. fact there i had no, yeah, I had I was no idea bring that up in the, in the intro but you know it seems appropriate <laughs> here uh but yeah i mean re really it's just it's it's uh repetitions and and you know training your your hands to to be able to um withstand that amount of, of force. And, and so I, I like to do like farmer walks for this all the time, just to maintain like a longer endurance of that same amount of, of, of force that I could hold. Cause a lot of times what, what fails first is the fatigue. Yeah. Cause I mean, and maybe initially you can lift and then you can hold it, but, but the longevity of that or like uh, the, the duration of that yeah. is the issue. Well, here's so, something so. along those lines though. I do want to say this is that oftentimes what'll give you a great contribution with stamina is just to get stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's so I, that's the direction I'm going to go with this because so I'm at uh, some of the weakest I've ever been on my grip strength in mm -hmm. a long time. Like my grip, that is the, if I were to go deadlift right now, what would limit me from going beyond 350 would be my grip, not my, mm -hmm. my, you know, my glute hamstring and back strength. And a lot of that is because I just am not consistently deadlifting and or doing farmer carries like I was. And the only thing that I did when I got to a place where I could bare hand grip 550 pounds and deadlift it was I was I was deadlifting three times a week. I was deadlifting three times a week and occasionally doing farmer walks mm -hmm. in there. And that's all I had to do. And I just I, what I did was I didn't progress the weight until my grip was strong enough to hold it. And so I just yeah. kept working that working that weight and gripping it and then adding reps and adding yeah. reps. And it was just I was so focused on deadlifting that my grip strength just came up with it. And now my grip strength is tremendously weak. I mean, I'm like a couple hundred pounds weaker in my grip strength right now than what I was just a couple of years ago. And I know it's just because I'm rarely deadlifting right now. It's yeah. like I intermittently 
interrupt my training with a deadlift session where I was deadlifting three times a week. So sometimes if you want to see your, you know, your deadlift, you know, grip and strength go up, like just deadlift more. Yeah. But you know, you know people don't test their grip. Like they test everything else uh, in terms of their training. So, I mean, here's something that's really easy that you could do. You could buy yourself some quality grippers they're, they're and they're, there's really good ones. I think one's called captain of crush. If I think is a, is a brand Captain that, crush. Yeah. Where they have oh, different yeah. like levels. You could buy a pair of these, and at the end of your arm workout, this is a good time to do it, right? At the end, and typically you don't want to work your grip before anything because when your grip gets fatigued, it's hard to work out unless it's like really a focus of yours, in which case I'd say fine. But you could get these grippers and then use them like you do strength training. You do some reps at the end of your workout. Don't go to failure, uh, but train them like you would train anything else. Do three sets of some gripping, some strength. Then you have isometric strength that you want to build, right? Well, that you could do with farmer carries. You could also change the grip that you use. So you could do what's called a pinch grip on some plates. Mm -hmm. So you could hold some like 25 or 35 pound plates or 45 pound plates if you're real strong with this pinch grip here. That'll strengthen it differently. You can also put a, a towel around a bar to make the grip much thicker. So now you're training a different range of isometric. You can also hang from a pull-up bar yeah, or- By your fingers. By your fingers or do rows. Or you wrap up towel around a bar, so you have to grab the towel and do some rows. But it, honestly, it's as simple as add like you know three to six sets a week of direct grip work, regardless if you deadlift or not. And just like any body part, you'll see muscle and strength gains uh, that will follow from that. Look, if you like our information, if you love the show, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. The rules that apply to somebody who is going from, a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as the, the rules same. that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.